we should go, I think, start at the Chok Yisodei Torah, at the very beginning of, of Rambam's Mishneh Torah. Some things we, we will skip, I think, but uh, let's begin at the beginning. So do you have the text before you? Yes, I'm pulling it up right now. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I've got it. Yilchot Yisodei Torah. Yesh Bichlalon Aisam Yisrof. So there are ten miswot from the Torah in this section of Yichot Yisodah Torah. The Rambam now lists them. And, and it's important, by the way, to read these introductions of the Rambam to each section of Halachot. Uh, it's not something technical. It's not something one should skip over. Sometimes, and this is something I learned from, uh, particularly from Hagon uh, Rabbeinu Yosef Dov Soloveitchik Zetzal, from some of his insights, that by seeing how the Rambam defines and describes the Miswot at the beginning of the section, one can learn very important things. So, Aleph, Leda Sheyesham Eloha. To know that there is a God, a creator. You will note that the, the word sham there is used here by the Rambam, which is reminiscent of the English idiom, right? There is such and such, meaning there, such, a, such and such a thing exists. Not there as opposed to here, but such a thing exists. The Rambam writes it in Hebrew, which in Hebrew we do not speak that way. Uh, this is an example of Rambam thinking in Arabic and writing in Hebrew. That's what's going on here, because in Arabic, the Arabic idiom is, there is, like in English, meaning there exists, such and such exists. So, Leda Shom Ishayesham Eloha. Beth Shelo Ya'alei Bamahashava Shayesham Eloha Zulati Hashem. So on the one hand to know that there is, on the other hand to know there is nothing else. There is no other power, no other divine uh, power beyond above humanity and in the same realm as, as Hashem or something in between, something like that. Gimel, In other words, to understand and to know that Hashem is one. Mori Barabi, Arab Yosef Gafi Hazetzal, was always at pains to point out that Rambam does, does not describe at any time that there being a miswa to believe, the Ha'amin. He speaks about leda, to know which means to understand, to internalize. And the same is true of, of what we just read out in the Gimel, to understand, to internalize this fact that Hashem is one. To love Hashem and connect to Hashem in a very profound way. To fear Hashem, which is part of the same idea of connecting to Hashem, if one understands and connects to Hashem in the, in the proper way, then mimela, these two things, on the one hand, ahava, on the other hand, yira, will, will well up in a person. Well, l'chadesh shamo, to sanctify Hashem's name in certain circumstances, in general, and also specifically in, in particular circumstances, as we shall see. And not to cause the opposite, which is to desecrate Hashem's name. Not to destroy or to bring about the destruction the uh, annihilation of things 
which are connected to Hashem. This refers to, let's say, a Sefer Torah or something like that, as we shall see. It includes the uh, the written name of, of Hashem and, and other things related to these things. Both. <clears throat> This also is an Arab idiom. We don't, we don't say that in Hebrew. We would say in Hebrew, right? To listen to a prophet who speaks in the name of Hashem. But in Arabic, to listen to what he, he says, to pay attention to what he says. Yod shalo lanasotho. In other words, this refers to the Navi, the prophet, not to uh, doubt once it is been, once it has been established that this is a, a Navi, a myth, a true and a reliable Navi who speaks in the name of Hashem, not to doubt him any longer, any further. <coughs> So now we begin to discuss these things one by one. So Parakrishon Harachalif. Yesod ha Yesodot, Ramud ha Hochmoth. You'll take note of the fact that uh, the Rambam here deliberately chose these four words, not only because of their essential meaning, but also because of the fact that. The, the, the first letter of each of these four words spells out the name of Hashem. Yisod ha Yisodot ve'amud ha'chumot. Leda, to know. Again, you see the word to know, to understand, to internalize deeply, profoundly. Sheyesh shem mosui rishon. That there is a primal being, probably is the best translation. Wuhu mamsui kor hanimsa. And he created, invented literally or brought into existence, all that exists, and all that exists in the heavens and on earth and everything in between, came into being from his, his, uh, pure and essential existence, the fact of, of Hashem's existence. <clears throat> this statement of Rambam, by the way, we just read, is almost identical to the, the, st the statements the statements of uh, the various Makubalim in, in, in various generations regarding how the created reality came into, into being. So in, in, in terms of these first principles, the Makubalim and uh, Rambam are on the same page, which is an interesting point to note. That everything came into being from Hashem, literally. From Hashem's essence and being. Kabbalah purports to explain how this happened, or how this came about, or, or, or the, the process of creation and the ongoing maintenance of creation so that it continues to exist. Um, from that point on, uh, the world of Kabbalah and, and uh, Rambam's understanding and theology and philosophy uh, diverge. But uh, at this initial point, they are saying the same thing. In my book in front of me right now, this is Halakha Beth, but I'm not sure that it is so in all editions. Let me just check. 
It's also Allah Beth on Mechon Bomber. It is, okay. I just opened that up so I have it in front of me as well. Yes. Ah, no, well, actually, no, that's not true. Because in Mechon Mamre, you will note that you have the, the letter, in other words, the, the numbered order of Halachot on the right-hand side of the right margin in block letters. And that which appears uh, in brackets the letter Beth in brackets is to tell you that in some of the printed versions, this is Halakha Beth, but uh, not, not according to most of the manuscripts, apparently. It, it, it should be noted that um, there is not complete agreement amongst the manuscripts either as to the precise division of the Halachoth or the numbering of the Halachoth. But uh, as I recall, uh, and so what what, what uh, Shlomo ben Avraham Shalom did in such cases was to have the what seems to be the more correct system of numbering on the right hand side and the wherever you have a halacha that appears in this or that printing or edition edition uh, a different uh, numbering system that's in brackets. All right, so im yale ala da'at shuhu now, were it to, were we to assume for a moment, that such a creator does not exist, and the only possible conclusion would be that nothing could possibly exist. Again, this is a, the, uh, sort of the, the other side of the coin of, of, the, of the first statement. Everything comes from and is rooted in Hashem. So if there is no Hashem, there is no creator, then nothing could exist. That is the essential Torah position in terms of Jewish philosophy of existence, of, of creation, of uh, the relationship between the creator and the created. And if the creator does not, would not exist, if we would imagine such a thing, then the uh, created reality could also not exist. On the other hand, we'im here doesn't mean only if, but if we were to, on the other hand, we were to assume the opposite. Were we to imagine for a moment that all created existence did not exist, and that could be, that, that is a possibility, because they were created, so that means that they did not, by definition, need to exist. That which is created can either exist or not exist. The creator is the only thing that must exist. That is one of the essential uh, definitions and differences between the creator and the created, between the bore and the nivra. So if other things did not exist, if we were to assume that for a moment, he, Hashem, would still exist. He, his existence is in no way contingent on the existence of anything else. He would not cease to exist because they cease to exist. Because all created things, all existence, requires Hashem's existence to exist. But he, Hashem, Baruch Hu, he does not require their existence, not all of them together, and not any one of them in particular. In particular. In other words, the definition of the bore as opposed to the nivra, is that the bore is a being in existence that is independent of all other forms of existence and has no need for anything else and is not 
dependent upon or contingent upon anything else. Whereas everything else, everything else, which is nivra, by definition, does not have pure, essential, and uh, unconditional existence, like the Bore, and, ex and exists only because Hashem brought it into existence, and also maintains constantly its existence. This again is a statement that Ramam is making here, which is entirely um, Essentially, it's not just analogous; it's it's identical with the st with statements made by the uh, by the Mekubalim, different periods and different uh, wordings, but the idea is the same. So now, according to uh, some editions, Halachabeth, and according to others, this is still Gimel or something like that. Lefichach en amitato. And therefore, Hashem's existence is by definition different and distinct from the existence of any other form of existence or being. And this is what is meant by the Pasuk, Yemiyahu. Elohim He only is the truth, that is to say, pure, true, unconditional existence. Who levado ha'emeth, wa'en ahir emeth ka'amito. No other form of existence, no other concept, nothing else can be compared to this unconditional and uh, essential existence of Hashem. And this is what the Torah states. And there is nothing else beyond Hashem. There is no other form of existence that, that about which one can speak in these terms. Because all other things were brought into existence and can also cease to exist and would not exist were it not for Hashem's ongoing will and maintenance of, of those forms and, and those realms of existence. Okay? This primal being, this being Hashem, is the Lord of the world, of the universe, Adon Kol Ha'aras, Master of, of, the, of the earth. Literally, and he um, maintains literally the uh, celestial spheres as as they continue to turn. This is was this was the uh, this was the understanding of uh, astronomy that was accepted and understood by all experts in the field at, at that time that the various heavenly bodies and the universe was altogether some kind of a very complex, uh, something like a, a watch mechanism with various parts and wheels turning. That's what that's the word galgal literally means a wheel. And they understood that the uh, heavenly bodies were, were actually sort of embedded in some kind of a, a wheel, a celestial wheel that, that turned, which you couldn't, you cannot see the wheel, but you can see the body on it. All you have to do, of course, to uh, understand it in, in uh, more modern terms is to, uh, instead of the wheel, you have 
gravity and uh, other aspects of celestial mechanics. And that really brings us to discussions of uh, Isaac Newton and uh, Albert Einstein and others. And uh, I, for one, do not believe that we, even today, have a complete understanding of celestial mechanics. There are other aspects. It has been suggested by some, at least, that there are other aspects of uh, reality or certain forces that, that also have an impact on uh, the, the behavior of, of the planets, the stars, the universe, such as electrical charges, uh, etc. not just uh, gravity, etc. There are many things, of course, we don't understand about the uh, observable universe, uh, such as the fact that it uh, continues to expand from what we know, and that uh, not only does it expand, but it's, the rate of expansion is on the increase. Uh, this was all a big surprise to astronomers when they discovered and discovered these things in the 80s, particularly, I think it was, with regards to the increased rate of expansion. Keep in mind also that less than 120 years ago, almost everyone was convinced, including Albert Einstein, that the universe was steady state. It was just there somehow and uh, not moving anywhere, not going anywhere, not expanding, not contracting. No one really, and they didn't really have any explanation how it came to be, but it just was. And, uh, and it was unchanging. Albert Einstein did very much in fact, disliked, in fact, detested the idea of an expanding universe, but he had no choice but to accept it when Hubble uh, told him to look in the telescope and look at his <laughs> photographs and look at his calculations and he proved it to him. And he said, yes, well, that's how it is. And he had to therefore also make changes to his theories as is, as is well known. He described, he described his, what he called the uh, cosmic constant, I think he called it. Uh, which prevented it, which he thought was preventing the universe from expanding. He had to invent this constant, this power, this uh, part of his formulations in order to describe a steady state universe, which of course didn't exist. So then he had to get rid of it. And he described this as his greatest blunder. So we, we learn things slowly over time. And uh, we usually think that when we've, when we've learned something that we figured it all out, but in actual fact, we discover later that we haven't figured it all out at all. Uh, and uh, probably we'll, we will discover many more things uh, and understand that we didn't understand nearly as much as we thought we understood. So, so Rambam said that this creator keeps the universe turning and, and moving, and today we can add expanding and all the rest of it. He is responsible for this. And In other words, the, the, the Rambam describes the power, the, uh, the, the power, that, the energy required to, to keep all those celestial spheres turning as they do, because things don't turn by themselves. This power, Rambam says, is without is, is immeasurable and beyond computation and understanding. And the same, of course, we can say today in a slightly different formulation based on the uh, coming into existence of universe from nothing and, uh, and subsequent expansion and continued expansion. Uh, all this, of course, bespeaks incalculable, incomprehensible, power. And uh, if one thinks about these things, that itself should bring one to a state of, of awe, as Rambam later discusses. We're talking about power that has no end, that is ongoing. The, literally the, the celestial spheres, the, these wheels that they imagined existed, are constantly turning. We have Shashi so below It's not possible that these things should turn if no one is making them turn. 
things do not turn by themselves. And it is He, Hashem, Baruch Hu, that causes these things to turn and to act as they do. Literally, without a hand and without a body. In other words, Hashem achieves all of this without any physical existence. And of course, we know that from what we do understand about the subatomic world, and there too, we are constantly, constantly discovering new things and uh, new discoveries that have only been made over the last 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, even more recently, are constantly overturning almost completely uh, former previous understandings. We know, of course, that everything really is on the move. Atoms are on the move, and the insides of atoms are on the move. The subatomic particles, which are now numbered, I think, in the many hundreds, uh, are constantly moving, right? Nothing, nothing is actually steady state. Not, not only the universe is not steady state, even atoms are not steady state. Everything is on the move, electrons and, and uh, all the particles much uh, which have been discovered so the the universe is is one huge packet as it were of energy which is somehow kept in a, a state of of order and equilibrium so that existence exists so that th so that things can in fact exist so a modern formulation might put it this way the world of, of uh, matter and energy, which we know are different forms of, or so we, we understand today more or less, are connected or different forms of the same thing. All of, all of these things and the, the constituent parts, in other words, the, the atomic world, the subatomic world, all this is from Hashem and all, all of it is, was, put in place and created and is maintained in, in this form by, by Hashem, the Creator. Nothing else can explain, will ever explain uh, the, reality, the reality of existence except for one, one Creator. With the Av Davarza and understanding, again, the are not to believe, but to know, to understand, to internalize this, these, these facts. Miswat Ase, it is a Miswat Ase from the Torah, says Ramban, to know, to understand these things. I am Hashem, your God. This is, of course, from Aserat uh, Hadibro, from the Ten Commandments. And anyone who imagines, who imagines there is another uh, creative power or God beyond this, this one creator that we speak of, is, is transgressing Miswat Lot Ta'ase. So to know and, and understand on the one hand is a miswat aseh, and to imagine anything else is a miswat lot aseh. And this is, this is known as, this is referred to by Hazar as being a kofir be'ikar. In other words, Rambam is telling you, you don't have to do any, any physical action. You don't have to do anything in order to either perform or live by this miswat ase or to transgress the miswat lotta ase. It's not, a, it's not a question of action. It's a question of thought, of mind. So these miswat are entirely miswat of the mind. 
Right, Rambam says, well, the afdavaze, knowing, understanding, internalizing the, this fact is a miswat aseh. What does that mean? That means he who imagines the opposite. He who thinks. Who is of the opinion that the this is not so, but some, but rather it's another 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 opinion. That this is not so, but some, but rather another another understanding is is a, is a correct understanding. Just that thought itself is a miswat lotase, and this is called kefira ikad to deny the the ikad that is the main and essential tenet of the Torah, of reality. As Rambam says, Shazehu ha'ikara gadol, shakol talui bo. This is the essential principle on which everything, from which everything else flows. Um, I recently got a copy of Or Hashem from my, from, from the library at the university, and I haven't, had a chance to read through it fully, but in the uh, beginning, Rabbi, Rabbi yes, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. he uh, he takes an issue with the statement of the Rambam, if I remember correctly. It's a and, word, huh? Yeah, and he seems to think that the second of the Ten Commandments has like two separate commandments of not bowing down to foreign gods and not having foreign gods, but mm -hmm. believing or not believing isn't like a commandment in itself. Oh, this is true what you say and, and there are there are others that have uh, raised questions about uh, Rambo's formulation Rabbi uh, Hestai Kreskas is one of one of those uh, there are others also Sefer uh, Karim Rabbi Ishaq Elbo is his name uh, is another. Um, that's that's true, and one one could uh, one could differ with a, with an, an, an interpretation of of those pesukim uh, of those miswot in the Torah. One could even dis discuss whether uh, these things are are in fact. To be regarded as or defined as misworth. The Maharami Prague also uh, claims that uh, that a miswa is always, is always involves action, and therefore, I am uh, the Lord, I am Hashem, your God, etc., is not a miswa because it doesn't involve doing or saying anything at all. So yes, there are there are differences. There are uh, various approaches to defining the, all of the miswot uh, and defining some, some of these things that we're reading about here. On the other hand, no, I don't think anybody uh, disagrees with the, the truth of these statements. The question is whether is you, you count it as one of the Tariyav Miswoth or not. And if you don't, that means you have to have a slightly different Heshabon, a different uh, list of, of the Miswoth. And we know there are different lists and uh, different ways of uh, listing and defining and, uh, and uh, categorizing the Miswoth. We know this. There are a number of systems that we have. For now, we're learning the, the Rambam's uh, shita and approach, but it, the essential truth truths of these statements, I think, is is uncontested. It's it's more of a uh, I wouldn't say purely technical, but it's uh, it's a secondary question whether we define this uh, essential belief or assumption or understanding whether we understand this to be a mitzvah or it's not con not included as one of the miswot, but that doesn't mean it's not an essential foundational principle of the of the Torah. Okay. So halacha hey ozayin elo azeh this God, this Creator, is one. Eno lo shenayim 
הוא לא יותר על שיניים. He is not two or more than two, or any other number, אלא אחד, one, but one in a sense that is different from what we normally mean when we say one. It's not, what, not the same thing as what we mean when we say one person or one apple. Because there are many other apples and many other people. But now we're talking about this particular one. אלא אחד שאין כאיחודו. אחד מן האחדים הנמצאים בעולם. There is nothing else that is truly deserving of this term, of this definition of being one. Because, again, one apple is, is, is uh, one particular object of a type of object of which there are many, which are identical, essentially. So there's nothing unique by saying one apple or one person, you're not saying that this thing is unique in es- essentially in its essence, in its being, in a, in a manner which is distinct from everything else that is similar to it. Because Hashem, there is nothing similar to Hashem and nothing can be compared to Hashem. And only Hashem's existence is, is uh, unitary in this sense. לא אחד כמין. In other words, we don't mean that uh, there, there is one type or species of, of thing called Hashem, such as there are people, there are many kinds of people. We can talk about all people as one kind of being, but we know that that includes, by definition, many, many people. In fact, billions of people. So no human being is unique in that sense that unique compared to other human beings, yes, but not unique in terms of its of its that that particular person's existence, the the, the fact of his existence. Lo ehad kamin shahu kolel ahadim ahadim harbe, v'lo ehad kiruf, and not one in the sense that it is one discernible object, physical object that has. And it has physical, measurable borders or boundaries. Shohu nehlap lemahlakot uliksawoth. Also, it's not it's not one physical reality as as if we talk about physical realities, created things that have, by definition, therefore they have boundaries and 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 uh, and uh, measurement and and size and also therefore. You can talk about you know the one end of this thing and the other end of this thing. You take an elephant, so you have you have the trunk here and you have the tail over there, and you have many other things in the middle, and it's all one thing. But it's not made, it's not one thing in the absolute absolute sense of the word one. It is actually many things which together create, we define as an elephant. <laughs> Here we are discussing with regards to Hashem, a kind of oneness that is unique. Essential unitary existence, which is beyond our comprehension and is by definition distinct and different from every other form of existence that we can possibly perceive. Ramam continues and he says, this is now halacha well, or continuation of Zayn, Inu hayu ha'elohoth harbe, were it to be the case that there are many gods, divine beings, hayu gufim u'gmiyoth, mipnei she'en hanimnim hashawim b'masiyatam nifradim zamiza ela b'mora'im she'er'u ha'gufoth u'ha'gmiyoth. In other words, we said before that Hashem is not material. There's no physical existence. That which defines and separates physical beings one from the other, shall we say human beings, 
is that you can say, well, this human being is over, over there, standing in that corner of the room, and that human being is standing in that corner of the room. And you can see that they're different. You can, first of all, they're not in the same place. And they cannot be in the same place at the same time. And they each have physical boundaries. You can say, well, he begins here and ends here, etc. If there were many divine beings, how would you define them? They would have to, they would have to be physical, material beings, which you could then define and measure and, and uh, perceive individually, separately, by virtue of their physical being, because that physical extension of being only covers a certain space. So uh, this person is, is five foot ten, and that person is six foot tall, and uh, you can, and they're, and they, they're not op occupying the same space, so you can define them in terms of their physical being and the, and the differences between them. If you were to speak about different or various gods, they would have to be physical beings. Otherwise, you couldn't distinguish between them. Wailu, Ramam continues. Wailu haya hayothir guf uhuya. Now, were the creator to be a physical being, to have a physical existence, a body, literally? By definition, it, it would have to be limited in, in size, that physical existence. However large it might, might be, it would have to be limited. It could not be infinite. It is impossible that something be, on the one hand, a physical, material being. On the other hand, that it should be infinite. Everything physical is finite. Only that which is not physical can possibly be infinite. B'chol she'esh lo kesu tachlit, and anything that does have a physical end and, and uh, is limited in, in, in scope, in size, in that something which can be measured and, and found to be of a certain size, but no greater, anything which is finite, Yes, its power, its energy is also limited. If, if a being is physical and its power is therefore in the physical realm, however great in size it might be, its power is also limited and finite, not infinite. Ramon continues, Welohenu Baruchu, this is uh Zain or continuation of uh, Zain. Welohenu Baruchu and our God, Baruch Shemo, sorry, I should say, Welohenu Baruch Shemo, Ho'il, Uchaho en Ochis, Wainov Posek, seeing that his we have already discussed and established that his power is without end, is, it is infinite. He said before that he brought, Ramam spoke before about the celestial spheres constantly turning without end, and this clearly implies infinite power. And in our own formulation, we, we speak about uh, a universe coming into existence from nothing, which Ramam also discusses, of course, and many others. Um, And that all of that existence is immense and beyond our comprehension, even in terms of its physical extension and, and, and size. And uh, that it is also constantly expanding and it's, all, it's full of energy, which is ongoing and uh, without end, even down to the uh, smallest subatomic level that we can perceive. Seeing that this is all true, in other words, again, the universe is constantly turning or working or moving. So therefore, we must under assume, understand, we must conclude that Hashem's power is not power that emanates from a physical being, body, which by definition would have to be finite. 
وَهَوِيلٌ وَيَنْعَقُفٌ سِنْدَ بِنْ هِيْ نَوْتْ الْفِزِيكَلْ بِيْنْ لَا يَرْعَوْ مَرْعَوْ ثَعْوَفُ those things which are part of physical existence those things that happen or can happen to physical beings cannot possibly happen or be said to exist in terms of Hashem. So when we, we speak about physical beings, we can, as we said before, we can distinguish between them because of the fact that the physical being is finite, limited in, in size, in space, and can be therefore discerned as separate from something else, which may be very similar, but it's separate because it's another thing. It is therefore impossible that Hashem, who is not in any way physical and therefore cannot be divided or separate from something else, it is impossible that Hashem should be anything but one. With the Avdavarza and understanding and internalizing this basic, fundamental, essential perception and uh, comprehension of reality, and, and therefore Vashem's reality, understanding all of this, Miswat as in Rambam's thinking, this is to be defined as a Miswat Ase. According to Rambam, the Pasuk, Shema Yisrael, uh, is in fact a, a miswa which tells us and informs us that we must understand and must uh, internalize this, these facts and, and uh, these basic understandings and perceptions of, of everything, of existence and how it came into existence and, and who brought it into existence and therefore the nature of that creator who brought it into existence. Understanding these things, knowing that he is immaterial, knowing that he is one, knowing that he is infinite, in in, and his power is infinite, etc. Knowing all these things is a miswat ase. And as we said before, even if one disagrees with Rambam's uh, categorization of, of various miswat and claims that, uh, as Maharaj claims, that, that uh, understanding, perception, or what some people would call belief. In other words, something which does not involve a physical action is not to be defined as a miswa. It goes without saying that, that we all, all, all hachamim have always accepted the, these essential truths to be the case and to be the fundamental underpinning of, of the entire Torah. As Rambam said before, in al uh, wow, or Dalid, to, to, to think the opposite is to be a kofir be'ikar, which is a concept which exists in Chazal, whether it's a miswa or not, it's, it, the concept exists. And this is this understanding is the ikara hagadol shakol talubo. Everything is predicated on, on these understandings. I think we shall stop here for today. Zohar um, Hashem will continue next time from Alecha uh, Hef. Thank you, Rabbi Bar Chaim. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one, if you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.
If you are inspired by Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to get involved in Torah Eretz activities in your local area, please fill out the relevant form by going to the link which appears on the screen.